Hello. Welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero, and we have come to issue number four of Nintendo Power for January and February of 1989. Let's get started. Our cover for this issue is Zelda II The Adventure of Link. Well, this is one of those covers that slightly falls apart when subjected to a closer examination. Link's sword looks like a plastic sword that's been wrapped in reflective tape and had a light shined on it, sort of the Tron effect. And for some reason, Link is wearing a net. All finally, Zelda looks like a plastic mannequin, probably because she is a plastic mannequin. I mean, the idea behind this cover is good, but the execution is poor. Our first article for this issue is another wrestling game with WWF WrestleMania. I'm sorry, let me get this right. WWF WrestleMania! We get a list of the characters and all of their moves. This game is crap. It is an utter, total load of crap. You can't grapple in this game, there are no holds, there are no real suplexes, there are no body slams, there's nothing. For all the faults of NES Pro Wrestling, it at least tried to replicate the look and feel of a professional wrestling match. What a match is actually like, or at least looks like when you watch it on television. This doesn't even do that. It doesn't even replicate the look and feel and the style of WWF matches from the time, in terms of Hulk Hogan can't power slam a guy. I mean, you, you can't have Hogan body slam Andre. You can't have you, nothing. Nothing of the WWF from this time period is in any way represented in this game, aside from the sprites for the characters. This is this is a terrible game, and heck, I can't even manage to consistently land blows on my opponent. Every single match in this game is a total crapshoot, dependent entirely on how you exploit the AI for the characters. That's not good game design in any vague way, shape, or form. It's just... It, it's bad. It's really bad. I'd almost call this the worst wrestling game for the NES for this time period, but there's also Muscle. And I haven't played that yet. And hopefully I won't have to. So yeah, don't play this game. Ever. Next, we have the continuation of Captain Nintendo, and that's really all I can say about this. It continues. Um, we then have, well, Sesame Street, Ernie's Magic Shapes, and Astro Grover. Two games for young children, which means I am in no way qualified to evaluate these games, so I'm just going to skip this one, too. However, after this, we have the biggie. The sequel to The Legend of Zelda, Zelda II, The Adventure of Link. We get a rundown of the power-ups in the game, as along with the various magic spells that you can get in this game. Yeah, if the last game gave kind of lip service to the concept of the RPG, in terms of having sort of leveling up and getting hard containers to expand your life meter, this one has no bones about it. This is a full-on experience points, leveling up, spells, and which are powered by spell points, role-playing game. There are semi-random encounters, which you could theoretically avoid on the map, and you have experience points that are added in, into the mix, along with magic and, again, the magic point management. The article gives a walkthrough for the first area of the game, as well as maps for Parappa Palace, Midoru Palace, the Island Palace, and the Maze Island Palace. We also have a fold-out map of the entire game's world. As an aside, I really wonder if anyone has ever written up Hyrule as a campaign setting for any fantasy role-playing game, particularly any of the sort of old-school revolution retro cones, like Castles of Crusades, or Osric, or Labyrinth Lord, or, um, probably, probably not Lamentations of the Flame Princess, it wouldn't work for that, but one of those kind of games. Actually, come to think about it, if someone was really, if someone was knowledgeable about Hyrule and the setting, were to come up with sort of a netbook of, um, Legend of Zelda, or Netbook of the Lord of the Ring, N the Lord of the Ring, Netbook of a uh, Hyrule, possibly using some of the stuff from the Hyrule history book that Dark Horse Comics just put out, or also using material from the games as just that sort of stuff as well. As far as to put together a history and a setting, and using that, I would love to play in that. I mean, obviously you couldn't do it as a official in print campaign setting, but. Something like that, something I'd like to take a look at and maybe even play it. I don't know. Um, if that exists, please let me know in the comments. Thank you. As far as Zelda 2 goes, this is kind of grindy. With the original Legend of Zelda, different special abilities and weapon upgrades were unlocked by either finding them in dungeons or finding the people who had these upgrades 
and either getting them when your health meter was high enough or buying them outright with money. Here, you either automatically unlock certain moves by having your experience points reach the right level that lets you level up either your magic, life, or sword ability, um, or purchasing them. And honestly, it, it means that you're spending a large chunk of time just wandering around the world, killing dudes to get the money to eventually hopefully get the items that you need to progress. And this whole task is made more onerous by the switch from a top-down perspective, like the first game, to a side-scrolling perspective in combat. In the original Legend of Zelda, your attack animation appeared to have some reach to it, it's like you were swinging an actual sword. Like a long sword or... yep, yeah, long sword or something like that. Here, though, your weapon feels like a gladius. It's still an effective weapon to be sure, but one without reach to it, and this has made a particular problem because of the weapons being used by Link's opponents. Um, again, this would be something that would, in a game with better graphics or whatever, this probably wouldn't be an issue, because you just tap the block button or whatever to block the attacks and then move in and land your quicker attacks with your Gladius or whatever compared to their slow attacks. Something like that. Um, but here, enemies can hit you a lot better than you can hit them. You still can shoot your energy from your sword if your hit point hit bar is full, but the reach of the attacks doesn't go the full screen, as opposed to your first game where it would go as far as the screen went. Um, yeah, the combat just isn't fun here. Further, it feels like Link's shield isn't very effective. In the first game, if an attack would hit Link's shield in whatever direction he's facing, the attack would bounce off. This ability would be improved when you get the advanced shield, would cost you some money, but it broadens the area where, if you're facing that direction, arrows would bounce off, or sword shots, or whatever. Here, though, the shield doesn't appear to do anything. It's like, maybe there's like buckler-sized area on Link's Sprite where attacks will bounce off, but you can't really position yourself to put that between you and your enemies. There's an, a defensive magic spell you can cast called Shield, which I suppose increases the amount of damage you can absorb before you lose health, but it still doesn't appear to do much to protect your character from being hit in any way. It, it feels like a waste of magic points, I guess. I, I never really could tell how much it was affecting my character in combat. This all combines with problems with the Iron Knuckles, which are one of the enemies that you will encounter in the first dungeon, and who can easily predict whether you're going to attack high or low, and will move your shield into position to block those attacks with almost prescient ability. They can be beaten more easily with a downward thrust ability, but it, from my friend, it looks like you have to like really grind up your um, sword ability to do that. And that, and it, I mean, with the combat being as onerous as it is, the last thing I want to be doing is spending even more time doing tedious, tedious combat to get to what was the fun part of Legend of Zelda, the dungeons. So, well, I wouldn't exactly say this game is total crap. I would call it clear, definitely a mediocre game, and certainly a step down in the series quality. Considering the quality of the first game, I mean, it's, it's really a disappointment. All this said, though, I still want to run a D&D &D game in Hyrule. So, again, if somebody's done a netbook or something on this, please post a link in the comments. Thank you. Next is Skate or Die. Get a rundown in this article of each of the events you can play in the game. Now, Skate or Die itself is a little like Track and Field 2, and that's a collection of related sports minigames, in this case, all related to skateboarding. Also, like Track and Field 2, there's sort of a career mode that involves playing all the events kind of in sequence. However, that's where the game and Track and Field 2 kind of differ. Because Track and Field has qualifying scores for each of the events that you have to meet. Whereas, Skate or Die doesn't really have any similar high scores. You complete, compete in the event, you get your score, and you move on to the next one. And that's pretty much it. Um, thus, if you're really going to get anything out of this game, you basically have to play it against a friend, so that you have someone to compare high scores against. That said, the controls in this game are simple but responsive, making the game really easy to pick up and play, with the exception of one event, the Downhill Race. Of the events in this game, the Downhill Race is very similar to the Downhill Jam. 
Both races have you gunning down a set course to the end and trying to get the fastest time while doing tricks to increase your score. However, for some inexplicable reason, the controls for the two events are very different, which is a shame because the downhill jam controls were intuitive and made it really easy to do tricks and mess with your competition and that sort of thing. Whereas here, though, it's difficult to land tricks, it's difficult to steer, it's difficult to control your skater, it's just a royal pain in the butt. Still, though, I would consider this game fun, but I really recommend if you're going to play this, find someone to play it against. It'll be for a much more enjoyable experience. Next is Howard and Nestor. We have Nestor trying his hand at track and field 2 with Howard as his coach in the triple jump event. This turns out about as well as you would expect. Next is the Counselor's Corner. Of note, this issue is some advice finding the warp zones in Super Mario Bros. 2, as well as a warning about a glitch involving the Fry Guy in World 4-3, where if the Fry Guy touches you at any time during the fight, the exit won't appear. You'd think Nintendo would have caught that while preparing the NES port. I don't know if this exit still exists in the Super Mario All-Stars version of the game. If, if somebody knows if it's still there, please post in the comments. Moving on to classified information, we have the basically pause strategy for dealing with bosses in Mega Man, where you can have some kit hits on bosses count multiple by mashing the select button when your shot makes contact. We also have recommended um, Robot Master order for the game, specifically Cut Man, Elect Man, Ice Man, Fire Man, Bomb Man, and finally Guts Man, and then from there going to uh, Wily's Palace. The next game this issue is Marble Madness. After giving information on this game's enemies, they skip straight past the first two stages and to the maps and strategies for stages 3 through 5. Marble Madness itself is incredibly hard. Basically, you're having to navigate a marble, a rolling object with physics, very well emulated physics I should mention, through a downhill course evading obstacles with a D-pad. Now on the zone, on the zone that sounds okay. The problem is that this is a port of a game that used a trackball to control the marble, which makes sense because the trackball is a sphere, as is the marble, and you kind of get a better grasp of how you're moving the marble using the trackball. However, because of this, you got better controls in the arcade version than you got using the NES version, or could ever get using the NES version, with its four-directional D-pad. That said, I was playing this game on an emulator with an Xbox 360 controller for recording this gameplay footage, and I felt like I was doing a pretty good job. The D-pad did a good job of giving a broader range of direction than perhaps the NES D-pad would have done Earth otherwise. But still, the fact is that this is a game designed for arcades with, for a specific type of controller, and it just doesn't quite work as well on any other type of controller. Now, it's entirely possible that if you're playing this game with the NES Max, you'll probably get a gameplay experience like what I got with my Xbox 360 pad, where it's more straightforward, and you'd probably get better controls than you would on the normal D-pad. But still, I found myself running into a brick wall fairly early on. I suspect other people would as well. So keep that in mind when you're getting this game. We have another light gun game this issue with Operation Wolf. We get a full-size version of the game's cover art, and I actually kind of like it. It's an oil painting, and while the scale is slightly wonky, it has a nice sense of motion and action to it that I like. This is one of those pieces of video game cover art that, while now that I think about it, be kind of tacky to hang it on my wall, I'd probably do it anyway. We get a rundown of the various types of power-ups in the game and all the stages, though you can't really do strategies because this is strictly a light gun game. This brings me to the gameplay. In the same way as Marble Madness, Operation Wolf has some issues related to being an arcade to home port, primarily related to the controls. Operation Wolf was designed as a light gun game, in particular one with a specific control eccentricity. In particular, the game's light gun, which was shaped like an Uzi, would have had two buttons. One was the trigger on the gun, and the other featured a button on the side of the gun which would fire your character's rifle grenades which you need to use to manage the waves of enemies that are coming at you on screen, as well as vehicles like armored cars and helicopters. The game also mounted the light gun to a hard point on the cabinet to make aiming a little easier as well. If you played Terminator 2 Arcade, 
that you're probably familiar with this setup because it's basically the same arrangement except T2 Arcade had a two controller version whereas Operation Wolf was always just a one player game. Now the problem with all of this is that the NES version of the game has you using, if you're using the light gun, using the controller and the zapper. And the zapper only has one button. This makes handling the grenade launcher rather tricky. Further, the game has some problems managing all the enemies on screen because they didn't really cut too much in terms of having as many enemies on screen as from the arcade version, which means that there's flicker because the system's hardware can only draw so many sprites on screen at one time. Thus, if you're shooting at an enemy and you happen to pull the trigger at the time that the system has flickered that enemy out so they can draw another enemy, that shot, co shot counts as a miss, which means also that you've lost ammunition for missing that target. Now, there's an option to play the game using the controller, which all honestly doesn't control quite right either. In particular, when I was using the controller, I never got the sensation that I could put the crosshairs for my gun right where I wanted to. Though that said, I've gotten further in the game, much further than I did using the light gun. Also, the game has a problem of because it's an arcade port, it sticks with the quarter muncher mindset that they want to keep you feeding quarters into the game to make you keep playing it longer and longer and longer so that the arcade owner and ultimately the manufacturer of the game makes more money. So thus, because of this, you start the game with only one life and one continue permission, with a few exceptions. Some levels don't give you continues. So you can collect health, health boosts through the levels, and once you complete the level, you get your continue back for the next one. But once you use your continue, if you die, you're done. Which is a poor design standpoint from a game from a Nintendo game home console perspective because again there is no quarter slot on console so if they'd had a continue option or even an unlimited lives option on there or more lives or what have you this game would have worked much much better all this said this game isn't terrible but it has some real significant problems from a design standpoint that I simply can't look past honestly if I was to recommend playing this game I would recommend well Honestly, hoping that you get a version of the game that comes out for, like, I don't know, Wii, or, oh, uh, I don't know, PlayStation Move, something like that. Something which gives it sort of the House of the Dead overkill take, where they completely remake it, um, and basically take the continue option out of the picture and so it instead just gives you a lead, a point penalty or something, something like that. Other than that, I don't know, maybe emulate it on MAME, or find it a, a MAME version or something like that, or buy the arcade machine if you find, a, find one and have the money. But I would skip the NES version of this game. So next we have the Nintendo Powerball article. This is basically a rundown of NES football games, similar to the recap of the baseball games they did earlier. They're focusing on uh, three games this article. Tecmo Bowl, John Elway's Quarterback, and NFL Football from LJN. Let's start off with Tecmo, Tecmo Bowl. Now, Tecmo Bowl has some of the simplest controls of the games featured in this article, and that's something that works in its favor. One of the things that doing this whole series of videos has taught me is that with sports games, the more you have to think about the controls when you're playing the game, the more they get in the way of actually playing the game. This is to say that all modern football games being played on systems with controllers full of buttons are bad. It's just that intuitive controls are ones that are easy to learn and then get out of your way. All that said, all is not wine and roses with this game. The number of plays available is dreadfully small, basically just four, and all the defense needs to do is pick the right play that's in opposition to yours. It's sort of like paper, rock, scissors but with four options instead of three, so there's a 25% chance of getting steamrolled with each play. Additionally, once you've selected your player from the line of scrimmage, there's no way to change your player after the snap, unless you're on offense, in which case you automatically control whichever character has the ball. This is a real problem when you're on defense, as you want to be playing whoever is closest to the ball carrier. You want to start as a linebacker and try to push through the protective screen around the quarterback and sack him, and if the quarterback gets a pass off, you want to be able to 
be switched to whichever defensive end is closest to the receiver so you can get the tackle. What you don't want to do is have to turn around and race all the way back up the field from the line of scrimmage after the pass is completed, because if you do manage to catch up, it means the ball carrier has gotten way, way too close to the end zone for comfort. Still, this is a fairly fun football game. I wouldn't compare it to Blades of Steel in terms of being the platonic ideal of a football game, but I would say, though, that the game is fun to play, and it's definitely one of the better games in this issue. Next is John Elway's quarterback. And you thought we'd get through an issue of Nintendo Power without encountering a game by Rare, didn't you? Well, John Elway's quarterback is a game of American Rules Football developed by a British game developer. This is gonna hurt. So, where to begin with this game's problems? First off, there are no running plays in this game. No, really, every single play in this game, in some form or another, is a passing play. There are no handoffs from the quarterback to the receiver, and the receiver can't sprint or try to shake off defenders. He just gets tackled. The only way to gain yardage in this game is through passing, which frankly is the riskiest kind of play in football. It is the sexiest, because we all like to see the big, long, Hail Mary pass for the touchdown or what have you, and we love the interceptions leading to the big touchdowns, but it's also the riskiest, a big, big, big risk-reward ratio on the passing play. And this issue is also made worse, though, by the way you control passing. You pass the ball by running back from the line of scrimmage and then holding down the B button. This brings up a cursor, like a mouse cursor, which you move over to the player you want to pass the ball to, after which you release B. Through this process, your quarterback is completely stationary. And the problem with this should be fairly obvious, but if they're not, I'll elaborate. You're stationary. While, basically, this is a real football game, a bunch of very large, angry men are rushing at you who want to knock your head from your shoulders. And if you watch football, you'll notice that when quarterbacks pass, very rarely do they stay stationary. Only if the defensive line isn't doing their job and the offensive line is doing theirs, is the quarterback able to remain stationary, perfectly still, look around and pick his target. So instead, so what does what happens in the game is you get sacked a lot. Now, if this was an arcade cabinet, though, where if you're using a trackball to control the game, this probably wouldn't be as bad, because at the time, trackball technology was basically identical to how mouse technology worked, and it'd be like moving the mouse cursor around with a mouse. But you're not. This is the NES, which means you're using the D-pad, and maybe if you're lucky, you're using the NES Advantage with its arcade stick, or the NES Max with its more mushy sort of 360 pad. And this is all aggravated by the fact that the computer doesn't have this problem. It picks out its targets with ease and with speed. So you can't really either anticipate where they're going to be from a defensive standpoint, and they will have that pass thrown out well before you would have, even with like the fastest accuracy and with everyone in the open. Further, interceptions are come very regularly, and I really don't know how to determine if an interception occurs, but I have a guess. My suspicion is that if there's a defender within a certain distance of the ball's destination, and the defender is on the ball's line of travel, an interception occurs. Which, what this means from a gameplay standpoint, is that quick short passes for short yardage that you would normally see in actual football um, as the safer, reliable way to do a passing offense, well, they're far going to be becoming far, far riskier. Because... There would be someone in the in the way, even though they would probably be actually throwing a ball, they'd have to jump up or do other sorts of things and wouldn't be able to react with the speed that the ball would be traveling at. So instead, the big long bomb passes are actually have are safer. Sort of. Because the problem is if you wait for your receivers to go out far enough for you to send out a long bomb pass, you're more likely to be sacked because you're waiting for them to go out farther, so giving time for a defensive line to come in. And then once they're there, when you press B to bring up the cursor, you then have to move the cursor from the quarterback to the relevant receiver, which means while you're doing that, you're not moving, and the defensive line is getting closer, and you get sacked. So, 
Also, this is made even worse by the fact that the AI is incredibly good at keeping coverage on the receivers in such a fashion that still, you could still end up getting that interception. So really, there's no, no good reason under any circumstances to play this game. It's utter crap, and it's unfortunate that John Elway put his name on this piece of rubbish. Last and definitely least is NFL Football from LJN. Screw this game and the horse it came in on. This game is a pile of hot garbage. Rather than letting you see the plays on screen, you have to reference them from the manual, or in my case, from an FAQ. There's no career mode, you have basically single player exhibition mode, and the controls in this game are obtuse, to say the least. You press A on offense to snap the ball, B to pass it, which then puts you in a slow-mo pass mode. If it's in a passing play, then while in passing mode, you press a direction on the controller and the A button for the receiver you want to throw the ball to. The relevant direction for each receiver is indicated by an arrow over the receiver's head, except that you can't see the arrow because it's drawn poorly. Controls for the players then also feel sluggish as opposed to the other two games, which in spite of their faults, and for the case of John Elway's quarterback, they are numerous, they have fluid controls with characters who move quickly on the screen, emulating the fast pace of a football game. Here, everyone moves really sluggishly and slowly, and considering the better football games that are out there for the NES, there's really no reason to play this game at all. This is definitely an example of LJN being the rainbow of crap that it became known for later on. Just skip this game, don't play it, pity people who own a copy of it unless they're completionist collectors. Our final game article for this issue is... The article covering Metal Gear, the first installment of a long-running and very well-regarded series. Although, admittedly, the NES version of the game is not the one that Hideo Kojima designed. It was ported by another team from um, Konami. But anyway, we get strategies for the first four bosses of the game, as well as instructions on how to destroy the Metal Gear control computer. They do preserve the twist for who the villain is, though, which is nice. As far as the gameplay goes... Metal Gear is what I consider to be the first really new series to start in Nintendo Power. Legend of Zelda and Super Mario Brothers first appeared in Fun Club News. And this game also marks a point of where it's, I believe, the first stealth console game. It's not the first stealth game of all time. You can reasonably attribute that position to Castle Wolfenstein for the PC. However, it is the first game of this genre or subgenre to be released on consoles and this really can't be understated in the slightest. Now, this game doesn't totally popularize the stealth action genre. Um, there, you don't really see that much out of it and, or outside of this until, like, for example, um, first thing that comes to mind is well, Metal Gear Solid on the PlayStation, which really perfected this and brought it to, made it to fine art. But still, console stealth games really owe their success to this game, and it's can't understate the importance of this game from a historical standpoint enough. That said, this game really isn't without its faults. The most notable, but also the most minor one, is the translation of this game is atrocious. It, like, I feel asleep, and that sort of thing. That said, the sheer quantity and quality of the English of this game is just, it's famous. But it doesn't hurt the game, though, which is weird. With Castlevania 2, the poor translation ultimately really affected the playability of the game because hints were obfuscated and which, which hints were useful and which ones weren't were obfuscated by the really poor translation. Whereas here, mo it only really comes up with guards indicating whether or not they're asleep. For example, if an enemy says that he's getting sleepy, some Z's would appear over his head, but there's no dialogue saying he's actually asleep yet. When the dialogue on screen that says he's asleep comes up, the guard would actually be awake, meaning you need to take precautions. But that said, all you have to do is notice that, okay, when there's Z's over the guard's heads, you're asleep, you can act. Further, the vision angles for the guards seem to really vary. What would be a safe angle for seek up on one guard would turn out not to be a safe angle for another, and there are no clues to tell the difference. I do suspect that if Hideo Kojima personally had been involved in designing this port, he might have fixed these little mechanical difficulties, and the game would be much more enjoyable. I have nothing to prove this. 
I still recommend playing this game at least once, just so you can say I played the first Metal Gear. But other than that, unless you're like a real fan of the series, you can safely skip this. Or pick up one of the sort of remake versions of it that came out with the Metal Gear collections over the past few years. There isn't much of note in the Video Shorts article this issue, although we do get a few rather poor games mentioned. In particular, there's Friday the 13th from LJN, and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde from Bandai, both of which have gotten thoroughly dissected by the angry video game nerd. If they come up in Nintendo Power, I'll discuss them then. If not, I'll put links to his, epi his episodes discussing those in the show notes. In the NES Journal, we get another look at the NES hands-free sip and puff controller, and once again, I find myself bemoaning the fact that if you are a disabled person and would need a controller like this now, whether due to mental disabilities, um, in terms of disabilities affecting your motor control, or because, oh, I don't know, you were paralyzed in Iraq or Afghanistan, you have to go for third-party options, many of which are kind of something of a clutch. I do hope that with the PlayStation 4 and the next generation of consoles, that... Well, the console manufacturers keep this in mind and perhaps put together some sort of first-party, well-thought-out option for hands-free gaming for those who do not have the level of motor control that most normal people have. Not normal, but most normally abled people have. We then go on to an article discussing Nintendo's Play Choice 10, which lets you play Nintendo games in the arcades and compare your high scores with other people using NES hardware. And because of this, instead of using credits to get continues, your credits get you additional time on the machine, which honestly, I consider something of a rip-off. Unless you're using the PlayChoice 10 to demo the game, for lack of a better explanation, there's really nothing that goes in the favor of playing NES games in this fashion. We have an article about recent music releases and profiles of art of new hip and happening artists, with specific mention of new article new albums from Julian Lennon, the son of John Lennon, Debbie Gibson, and Huey Lewis in the News. Now, of those performers, Gibson and Huey Lewis are still touring, though Lennon has the most recent album of the three of them, with the album Everything Changes that came out in 2011. Our celebrity profile for this issue is something that is kind of a stretch, even for this column. Specifically, they're profiling Karch Karali, whose name I'm probably mangling, of the U.S. Men's Olympic Volleyball Team. And in the Where Are They Now category, from what I can find, his last gig was as an analyst for ESPN's volleyball coverage, and that was several Summer Olympics back. So I have no idea what he's doing right now. Maybe he's as a I don't know, he, he's working with the U.S. Olympic volleyball team? I, I got nothing. Um, in the letters column, we got a question about when we're going to get Dragon Warrior, and the answer basically is, well, when we have the chips to manufacture the carts, you'll get the carts. Um, in the top 30, new to the top 10 this week, we have Mylon Secret Castle and a metric buttload of new titles below the top 10 threshold, several of which were featured in last issue. The last issue, like Castlevania 2 and Track and Field 2. My pick of the week for this week is Metal Gear. It's fun, it's challenging, and requires players to use their brains. It requires you to take your time and think about situations rather than using just Twitch gameplay, while also still having some moments where it requires a little bit fast action and quick thinking and keep you on the, on the edge of your seat. It's a nice blend of, of fast and slow. It makes any sense. It's really, it is a really solid game, and it's, honestly, this game, Hideo Kojima deserved the massive illustrious career he got after coming out with, with Metal Gear, even though the NES version was a game that he wasn't directly involved in, and it, it still, it, it keeps with him, with the principles of what he had in mind, and it works, it works really well. And even though it's been remade, and adapted for more recent systems as bonus features for other Metal Gear collections in later years. 
I'd still say take the time to, if you can't get any of those other editions of the game, uh, of the Metal Gear games which have the original Metal Gear in them, I would recommend taking a look, uh, picking up the NES game and giving it a shot there. Um, unfortunately, Metal Gear is not available on the Wii's Virtual Console, so you can't get it there. Um, for the two-player pick, I would recommend picking up Tech Mobile. Um, that one is available on the Wii's Virtual Console. I'll give you good two-player fun with yourself and a buddy. So, that's definitely something worth getting. Um, in two weeks, we will have the next Nintendo Power Retrospective with issue number five as we approach the end of Nintendo Power's first year. If you enjoy these podcasts, please like them on, well, on YouTube. If you're watching this on Blip, there should be an option to click on the the link that pops up down here when you mouse over the video, go to the page for this, and click that you love the video. Also, please subscribe to my channel to get new updates for whenever a new video comes out, either on YouTube or on Blip. If you're on Blip, you need to use a have a Facebook account. Um, please feel free to post in the comments, all that good stuff, and I'll see you then for the next Nintendo Power Retrospective.